Kieran, what if you could find an authentic and gifted psychic medium mm -hmm. with the knowledge and experience of a psychotherapist Ooh. and the big, charming personality of a showman? I think all of my problems might be solved. Would you be excited? <laughs> I would be. Then get excited because that is exactly what we have on the show today. And he's going to help us understand what it takes to achieve deep emotional healing, radical spiritual awakenings, and the keys to making everything we attempt, attempt in life work. Prepare to be enlightened, energized, and empowered. Welcome to the Skeptic Metaphysicians. Oh, you're talking about me. My name is Will. And I'm Karen. And unlike Mulder and Scully, we both want to believe. So we've embarked on a journey of discovery. We've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical world. We've thrown ourselves into weird and wonderful experiences. I even joined a coven of witches. And wait, you joined a coven? Yep, all in the interest of finding something. Anything. That will prove that there's something beyond this physical. Three-dimensional world we all live in. This is The, the Skeptic, Skeptic Metaphysicians. Metaphysicians. Hey there, thanks so much for joining us again on this journey of discovery. As always, I'm Will. And I'm Karen. And today we have a special treat for you. He's spoken at organizations like the Edgar Casey's ARE and the International Association of Near-Death Studies. And he's appeared on Hay House Radio, Coast to Coast AM, Gaia TV, Home and Family, World News Tonight, Good Morning America, lots of other ABC, CBS, and NBC television shows across the country. He's also a regular guest at various unity centers, centers for spiritual living, spiritualist churches, and spiritual centers throughout the country. Karen, that's a lot of spiritual stuff. That is. Well, I am thrilled to welcome to the show Vincent Jenna. Vincent, thanks so much for coming on. Oh my gosh, for a moment I was wondering who, what great person you're talking about. And then I, I, every time I hear that intro, I'm always like, Really? Are they talking about me? I mean, who <laughs> wrote that? I didn't. But yes, thank you for having me. And both of you, what what energy. Unbelievable. I'm loving you already. Well, when we were doing the pre-interview talk a conversation, we knew right off the bat that we we're going to get along just fine. Vincent, let's just put it out there right from the start. Okay. What is the key to a radical spiritual awakening? You want me to say that right up front? <laughs> <laughs> We're cutting to the chase. So nothing will be over. It's nothing like curtain comes down. Nothing like ripping the band-aid right up top. No, there's a secret. That's a secret. <laughs> Just like my book, the secret that's holding you back. Well, look, here's here's the thing. We've been told, and whether it be from ancient wisdom, whether it be from modern psychology and all those wonderful motivational gurus out there, the Tony Robbins and all of those people, that we're capable of creating and manifesting a life of our dreams. We're capable of going after anything that we desire. And it's not just words. We've seen evidence of that. We've seen people that gone from absolutely nothing, small town, no money, bad backgrounds, abusive backgrounds, into unbelievable fulfillment and, and thriving. And so there's been examples time after time after time after time. So can we call that spiritual? Can we call that psychological? Can we call that just the human spirit? You hear a lot of that from people like skeptics who don't believe in spirituality. Well, I believe it's it's a combination of everything, body, mind, and spirit. We're more than just physical beings here. Whereas spiritual beings having a physical experience, what does that mean? We're energy. You want to bring science into it. We are energy forms. And, and it, it radiates off of this body in ways that it can be measured. So there's proof of that. Mm -hmm. So if we're energy forms then, then that means we can tap into other energy and forms of energy. And one form of major energy out there that we don't necessarily see with our eyes is the law of attraction or the law of manifesting. It's just like the law of gravity, the law of aerodynamics. We don't see it with our eyes, but we see it working. And we see the law of attraction and manifesting working because that's how people are attaining their dreams. What they want, it's not just a matter of going after it, but they attract opportunities to themselves. So there is evidence, plenty of it, that we are manifesting beings. But not everybody is manifesting what they want. It only seems to be working for some and not others. 
Well, I spent my entire life and my 40 years of working in this field, well, the metaphysical field, psychology field, and spirituality field, that's four decades of doing this work to come to find out why some are doing it and some aren't. And so that actually is what we put together, what I've put together to help people understand about themselves, about their capacities, and most importantly, is what's stopping them. So your question is, okay, what allows us to manifest? What makes us do all of that? What is that big boost and ingredient? I want to talk first about why we're not doing that. Why isn't it natural for everybody? What is getting in our way? And a lot of people would like to say that it's woo-woo stuff. It's, It's bogus material. There is no such thing as manifesting. It's either luck or just human spirit going after things. But it's much more than that. It's so much more than that because magic happens when you have the proper ingredients. Mm -hmm. But you've got to remove the blocks. And there's where the secret lies. You have to remove the blocks that are keeping you from that magic. And so that's where the therapy and the psychicness comes in because you do both, right? You're a therapist and a psychic and a medium, right? Yes, I'm both psychic and psycho. I said <laughs> that well, earlier. Well, and I, legitimately, no, I, I first became a psychic. This happened to me back when I was 28 years old. It, it's an incredible story, actually, and, and a long one. So to narrow it down, there was an abuser in my life. I was the tormented one in school. I was the bullied one. And there was one character who instigated a lot of that bullying. He was not only the class clown, but he was the favorite jock and and famous jock of the school. And so combine that, no matter what he said, everybody did. So he would cause those jocks, the kids, the girls, it didn't matter, no matter who it was, pick on me and abuse me. So I went through all of that. But at our 10 year high school reunion that I went to, I was feeling a little proud of myself because in the beginning of my life, I was a professional singer, actor and dancer. You wouldn't know that. You were in you were in the movie Grease, weren't you? You did your homework. I did. <laughs> Good for you. Don't ask me to hand jive unless there's a cardiac person nearby, okay? <laughs> Can't do that anymore. But yeah, yes, this is a family show movie. after all. So, oh, yeah, really. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> so, so, you know, I, I reached like a little claim to fame in my, my small town. I grew up in Levittown, New York, and that was a small little suburban community. And so anybody who did anything, you know, even if, if I wasn't one of the stars in the movie, to them I was. So mm-hmm. I went to the high school reunion. By that time, the movie was a block blockbuster hit, right? So I go in and it was like a Cinderella story. It really was because- awesome. I have not heard that term, but now I love it. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Did you ever see Cinderella with Jerry Lewis? I did not. It was an actual movie with Jerry oh. Lewis. I was here all was. excited that you had coined a phrase and no, no. Oh, I got to give credit where credit is due. That's, that's you know. Good. So I go to the prom, not the prom, it was the, the reunion, reunion, our first reunion, and the entire hall just froze. And because they never expected me to come. And I froze. I'm married already. I have a two and a half year old child. So I'm feeling really good about myself. And I'm there at the doorway and they just attack me. All the girls are all over me. Oh my God. They sat at my table. They wanted to know all my Hollywood stories. And that kid came running over to me, bear hugged me and wouldn't let me go. Just screamed my name and wouldn't let me go. And then sat with me through most of the night, bringing over the jocks. You gotta come over here. This guy is so funny. Vinny is hysterical. Oh my God. And he was just championing me the entire evening. And I I never had any, held any remorse or, or anger or resentment or anything like that for any of them. It was just an incredible evening. We became really close friends. As time went on, I started to notice that things were going wrong in his life, but he was not announcing it to anybody, but I was feeling it and sensing it, and I didn't know why. And after spending a weekend with him in his beautiful Connecticut condo, 
we were driving home, my wife and I, and I was in tears because I was feeling his heart breaking. And I'm like, I, I know something is wrong. I know his life is falling apart and he's not talking about it. He's not sharing it with anybody. He's, he's holding it within. And I cried out to God, literally, for the first time in my life, even though I was picked on, I never cried out to God for help. And this time I was begging God to give me the ability to help him and people like him. Now, I had no idea what I meant by that, what ability. I didn't know, but I needed something, some wisdom. Well, within a week of that request and prayer, Steven Spielberg and Cecil B. DeMille together could not have made an incredible epic movie that happened to my life from that moment on. I'm talking paranormal stuff galore everything from trancing to psychics coming in to meeting all these new crazy people woo woo like you cannot believe <laughs> and i was never into that the the most exciting paranormal thing i have ever done was go see poltergeist and that was <laughs> at that time or the exorcist too when i was younger mm -hmm. oh gosh yeah. put okay. those two together forget it mm. so i wasn't into that but then all of this stuff was happening to me. I was becoming psychic. I was becoming telepathic. I was re mind reading people un uh, unintentionally. And oh, and information was pouring into my head. And at one point I actually had to sit there and I just opened my mouth and it felt like somebody else talking and all these words came out and apparently I was trancing. Wow. And so thank goodness my wife, who my angel, she had been with me since I was 17 years old. And this happened at 28 years old. So she knew me and she knew what I knew and what I didn't know. And so when this was happening, she realized something was going on. And that's how it all began, the psychic part. But I didn't want to be a psychic. Those were crazy people who lived in California. <laughs> like, and they still do, by the way. I mean, <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, when all of this was happening, did you feel like you were losing it or did you just uh, know? No, I thought I was nuts. <laughs> plain, plain English. And then, uh, then they, you know, the biggest thing that concerned me and even till that to today, I will always question myself because I was wondering, was this something dramatic I was creating because I needed it? Mm -hmm. And because of all that abuse, and, and I wanted to be a professional singer, actor, and dancer, but, but then I was going, but this had nothing to do with that. And how is this going to make me famous if I was using it for that? Because again, I was unaware of the field. So I was unaware of the people who were out there involved already that may have names or things like that. I, it, it scared me. So I didn't know how to take it. I didn't know if I was making it up. I didn't know if it was real. And again, thank goodness, my wife was there and she was like, something's going on, Vinny. And we need to find out what it is. So I was told through all of this and through other people that I would be directed and meet the people who would help guide me in all of this. And I'm sitting in a doctor's office. I had an appointment. It was shortly after my first crazy paranormal experience with my wife. <clears throat> we're sitting there. We're talking about the whole thing really low. We didn't want anybody to hear. <laughs> it's just like, do you believe what happened last night? That was crazy. And I'm going out of here. And there's a woman that I didn't realize that was sitting next to us listening. And she interrupts. She says, excuse me, forgive me, but I couldn't help but overhear what you were talking about. And I feel the need and responsibility to help you. You are not going crazy. And she then started talking about her experiences, her connection with Edgar Casey and the ARE in Virginia Beach. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So I'm not going nuts. She says, no, you're not going nuts. And, and the messengers have to be awoken. And apparently you're a messenger is what she said to me. I'm a messenger. Oh my God, I wanted to be a singer, actor, and dancer. <laughs> like, like, do messengers win Academy Awards? I don't know. <laughs> but 
the guidance kept coming and I had to listen to it. Even though I was dragging my feet, I had to listen to it because it was something very positive. And more importantly, the information was so pure, so loving, so compassionate for the world, I couldn't ignore it. Mm. And so I, I just kept studying. I studied Edgy Casey material. I started researching other material. My library is filled with hundreds of books that I just had to grab, read even parts of them. I didn't finish every book, but I kept getting material. We would go to the library or a bookstore. And boy, back in those days, remember, this is this is in the 80s, the early 80s. So the spirituality section of the bookstore was called the occult section. That's right. <laughs> yep. And That's so right. you go to the bookstore in your <laughs> local neighborhood, you're like looking around the corner to see, <laughs> is anybody looking at us down this aisle? And we would pick up randomly books off of the shelves, the teachings of the masters of the Far East the Bhagavad Gita, and, and we would just thumb through it. And all of a sudden, I'd come to paragraphs of words I said during my trancing or the downloading. Wow. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I said this. It's written word for word, written in here. And so we knew I never read any of that material. So that's what started to validate my experience. Sure. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, almost 40 years later, thousands of people all over the world has validated it for me, which is why I wrote the book I wrote, because we are meant to create what we desire. That's how we experience ourselves here on this in this world. But there are things that we experience that got in our ways and anomalies that go on in the brain to help protect us from those experiences. Because mm -hmm. if you really look at it and look at time, We've been off the path and, and people have gotten it wrong for a long time now. And when I talk about getting it wrong, what they're teaching their kids, what are they, what the experiences they're going through themselves, you know, between all the abuses and the divorces and the, the children being abused and the molestations and, oh my gosh, we can, and the killings and the, we, that keeps bringing us back. And matter of fact, We've incorporated that as normality in society, and it's not. It's way out of whack. Right. It's way mm -hmm. off the path of who we are. Yeah. I've got a theory that people who are afraid of this stuff, they're doubling down, and they're doubling down, and they're refusing to move forward. I, th I think we're all in a period where we are transitioning to who we are supposed to be. We're awakening up en masse, but those people who are refusing to or kicking and screaming are, are now actually fighting back so hard that anything outside of their little box is completely and utterly evil, terrible. I mean, let's not, I'm not going to get political here, but th this oh, country. You, you can get political because <laughs> well, it's not political. Absolutely. Well, I mean, th this yeah, country yeah. has been mired in this, in this violent anger mm -hmm. that um, that is counterintuitive to who we are that I, I it's difficult for those of us that are waking up to you to are you 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 definitely will have a much more positive twist to it than I do quite honestly oh really you I just, thought I was pretty yes. negative <laughs> no, no you said you see a lot of people waking up and the problem is not enough mm -hmm. Do you understand what critical mass is? Of course. The story, okay, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible was actually written to teach us about critical mass. It wasn't an event that God did. It was what we're capable of as beings here on this planet. If there's more negative and not enough positive, we can absolutely destroy ourselves. Mm. That was the message of what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was complete chaos. There was complete anarchy, spiritual and emotional and morality uh, anarchy. Oh, my, my goodness. Kind of what's going on today. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, God. No, no. <laughs> oh, yes, 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 uh. yes. Here is the thing, and here's the whole point to that. 
Yes, there was an angel that came down, and that's kind of a metaphor and a spiritual kind of message. Somebody had a psychic awareness that if you go and wake up 11 people, that's all it took. Maybe Sada Gomorrah maybe had a couple of thousand people hmm. as residents, right? Who knows? But they only needed to wake up 11 people, and they would not be destroyed. Okay? And really, the message was you wouldn't destroy yourself. So the God force that we're tapped into, we use to manifest with. So it doesn't do anything. We do it all. Mm -hmm. And so we were using that energy to destroy ourselves. So if we revert, we could reverse it by waking up 11 people. That was the critical mass, 11 people to 2,000. And that positiveness would outweigh it. Well, we know the story. Lot came back and said, you know, I'm really having a hard time here getting anybody to wake up and believe in this spiritual stuff. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, nine. Nine then. Okay. <laughs> if, you, if you find nine, there may be some earthquakes. There may be some fires. Yeah, just keep your ass out of the way of the fire, okay? You're going to burn like hell. But you won't totally destroy yourselves. You will not destroy yourselves, Okay. Good. So he goes back in the town gung ho. Man, you know, one of these spiritual messengers, I'm going to wake you up. They thought he was nuts. <laughs> and the more he kept, and this is where I want to point your trueness and what you were saying, Will, the more he kept telling them how much that they can be saved and not die and have a beautiful life, the more they hunkered down to their negative beliefs and said, no, you're full of you know what. Get, you know, lot, get out of here, okay? And take your family with you. And so he went back and he said, hey, angel dude, I can't even find nine. <laughs> and angel dude said, well, just get your family out there as quick as you can because <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah is going to hell in a handbasket and real soon. And don't, don't, don't look back, don't look back. <laughs> because that is... That means you're still connected and you don't want to be connected. You want to be disconnected from the negativity. Move on. Well, it's what we're doing today. And here is the thing, Will. It's not because we fear. Yes, I know. Marianne Williamson wrote a really good passage in her book, Return to Love. It's, it's not our inadequacy that we fear. It's that we're powerful beyond measure. And yes, there is a great truth to that. That's a major truth because we used our power in the past. And again, Sodom and Gomorrah is a reflection of Atlantis. They didn't want to write about Atlantis, but that's exactly what we did. We harnessed the energy the wrong way negatively, and we completely destroyed ourselves. So think about that. Now you've got these souls incarnating lifetime after lifetime. What are they afraid of? They don't want to be powerful. I want to be ignorant of that. And at the same time that they're refusing to acknowledge their greatness, they're also their defense mechanisms, which is all about my book, The Secret That's Holding You Back. Their defense mechanisms came in to create a new set of beliefs for them to protect them from their original set and even the stories that they've been through now, more of the, I'm not good enough, I'm not deserving enough, I'm not lovable, I'm not all of this. And they're hiding that and they're, that they're latching onto that set of beliefs because it's all they believe they've got. It's their security blanket. If, if they let go of that security blanket, they're afraid they're going to be left with the understanding that they are really worthless. But if I can be angry at you, mm -hmm. this country is only part of it. This is happening all over the world. I mean, Putin just went out and started bombing the Ukraine. What makes him different than any of the insurrectionists or the people over here that are going crazy and attacking each other? You know, they're not, no different. We, it's the same all over the world because we're being Beings. We're human beings who have forgotten our magnificence and connection to our higher self. And once that happens, it's chaos. Hmm. And we fear not being cared about. That's what our fear is. And that's why we're holding on to the anger, because believe it or not, anger towards somebody else is a secondary emotion. And it's a defense mechanism, because if I can be angry with you, 
it distracts me from being angry at myself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I'm no good. And so, yes, is there hope? Not enough. And why do I say that? We always look at the external world to understand what's going on in the internal world. You can do that in your own individual life. And we can do that in the accumulative life, what we call Earth here. In your individual life, just look at the people who are going through chaos. Look at through all of the relationship issues that they're having, financial issues, health issues. People are dying left and right all over the place. I was a hospice social worker for several years, mm -hmm. and people were dying back then of cancer of the pinky under the pinky nail. That's how one of my patients died. Wow. Ridiculous diseases mm -hmm. because of all of this stress and chaos, financial burdens that people are going through. People are afraid to step outside. So that's individually. Now look at accumulatively. The earth, the weather's changing, the storms, the fires, the earthquakes, there's volcanic eruptions. It's, it's, it's like Pompeii all over again and Sodom and Gomorrah because we're causing it. These are not natural environmental disasters. They are human or spiritual mm -hmm. and initiated disasters because of our energy again. And so when you look at the world, a long time ago, we would have a crisis, and then maybe 10 years or 20 years would go by, things would settle down, maybe we'd, we'll learn from it, but we rebounded, everything was okay, we always come back, yay, rah, rah, and then another crisis would happen, and the same thing, we'd rebound, come back, that's not what's happening now. It's crisis after crisis after crisis, it's <laughs> after crisis, Nobody is having enough time to rebound. That is not a sign that we're waking up or we have critical mass. That's a sign that we have enough information out there. I will admit that. New thought, new understanding, a new consciousness shift, plenty of information on how to do that. More authors, including myself, with all of this incredible information. Yes, I'll admit that. But the problem is people don't know how to make that information work. They try to apply it and end up saying it's not working. That's why I wrote my book. It's not working because they're not believing what they think they believe. Mm -hmm. That's the abridged version of what I had to say. You just sewed up <laughs> years and years of my thinking <laughs> into such an eloquently stated, I mean, the, the whole Solomon Gomorrah story, yeah. it, I mean, it yes. that just literally smacked me in the face with the similarities. Mm -hmm. It's scary. So, so are we just screwed? Um, that was about to be my question. Uh, do we have, do, is there no hope whatsoever? Or is there anything we can do? My colleagues, I have many colleagues that like the pretty pictures, because people like the pretty pictures. They call it hope. Mm -hmm. I am the tell it like it is psychic, okay? Because here's the thing. You go to the doctor because you've, you're experiencing a major pain in, in your body. And the doctor's nice. Hi. You know, <laughs> really nice. What can I help you with today? It's just like, you know you're going to be okay no matter what's wrong. It's like, and you're sitting there going, but I'm in a lot of pain and, and I don't know what to do. And he's going, but that's okay. Think of it as how much worse it could be. It's not really <laughs> that it. How long would you stay in that friggin' office? Not Here is the way I like in my work. You and I, or all three of us, are walking down the streets of Manhattan you guys are in a big discussion. I happen to look up and I see a baby grand piano is being hoisted from the 40th floor somewhere up onto the roof and the rope breaks. And that baby grand piano is headed towards the three of us. Now, I've got one of three responses that I can do. One, I can run like hell to the other side of the street and say, <laughs> that's where karma suckers go at it. <laughs> <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> Not going to interfere. None of my business. Or I can, like so many people now, it's in spiritual woo-woo land. Excuse me. 
I, I, I don't mean to interrupt your conversation. Really, <laughs> I don't have the right to influence any part of your life, but I just want to let you know, before I even complete half that phrase, you'll be dead and me with you. <laughs> right. Or I can grab you by the freaking shoulders and throw you out of the way with me. Now, in the process, you may land on the ground and sprain your wrist or even break an ankle, but I've saved your freaking life. So how would you like me to work with you now? <laughs> Do you want me to tell it like it is? Yeah, no, I'm Teen Vincent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then understand right now we're going to hell in a handbasket unless, and here is the great part about that. We have the resources now to do the work. Stop being so damn afraid to face yourself because I got a surprise for everybody who's listening. There is nothing wrong with you. There are things wrong with the story you went through. There are things wrong with the beliefs that were created for you, about you. But there is nothing wrong with who you are unless you keep giving in to those maladaptive beliefs because that's what's going on. You may think you're doing the work. You may think you're reading the book, but you're not going deep down inside to deal with that little kid who went through some trauma, who went through some crap, who heard some bad messages out there. There. That's the one. That's where your belief systems are. Your unconscious mind is what's connected to the law of attraction, not your conscious mind. The concept and the idea is we, we pass around some beautiful understandings with some misguiding understanding with it. For example, how many times have we heard thoughts create? Thoughts create and that's what you got to pay attention to is your thoughts. And the whole thing is thoughts do not create. Thoughts do not manifest and they do not create. Your beliefs do. But your unconscious core beliefs, not your conscious beliefs. I can ask anybody today, and I did this while I was going to school and doing research. Do you believe in yourself? And 90% of the people that I ask will always say, yes, of course I believe in myself. Of course I believe in myself. And then when I did some research and I wrote about this in my book, I did further research and I started to probe and ask them questions about their lives, about their relationships, about their past. And they were all fairly negative, all different ranges of that negativity. And so then when I confronted them again with, so, with all of that, do you really think you believe in yourself? And they'll go, oh, I guess I don't. Hmm. I guess I don't. I didn't realize it. That's right. You didn't realize it because your brain purposely created defense mechanisms so that you can function in your life. But you are a spiritual being. You're not here to function. You're here to thrive. Hmm. And I want people to thrive because functioning is not working because that's what's going on out there. Because you've got one group of people who believe that the way to function is to destroy or to control this group of people over here. And that's not the way it works. You can't even control yourself and you're trying to control somebody mm -hmm. else. It's about learning how to get rid of those inner, deep down, self-denigrating beliefs. Mm -hmm. So you have to face what needs to be healed. And what needs to be healed doesn't look pretty. But doing the work is the most beneficial work. This is how we save ourselves and save the world. Mm -hmm. Do the work to yeah. thrive, to finally go after your dreams. And if you don't know your dreams, doing the work will release your dreams and make them conscious. You unconsciously suppress them because it's very painful to think you can't achieve your dreams because you're worthless. So you hide them. But they're in there. Everybody comes in with a purpose because we're here to experience ourselves and all that we know, all that what's ingrained inside, all of our abilities. And one of the best ways of doing that is by having a purpose, having a dream and pursuing it. So everybody has one, but everybody also has a story that maybe has hindered and impeded 
that attempt. Mm -hmm. I just got off the phone with a couple of clients today. Every time I talk to people, every time, it, 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 it doesn't fail that I cannot even begin to write the stories of what people have been through, yeah. what they've been through. Yeah. And I'm like, no wonder why you're not going after your life. No wonder why you're not going after your knight in shining armor or your princess or your or better finances or better health. There isn't an ounce of you who believes in you. You have to. And what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It, it, it seems like the more people need it, the less people do the work, mm -hmm. right? So what you're saying really resonates with Karen and I tremendously. It really is going to resonate with most of the people listening to the show right now, I would say. The question is, though, how do we get that message to sink in to those knuckleheads who really need to take a look at themselves that are trying to control everything out there that aren't willing to look at anything outside of the Sodom and Gomorrah? Yeah, I know. That's an excellent question. And people ask me that all the time. How do we get it to sink into them mm -hmm. by letting it sink into us first? Because there's a major reason. Why do teenagers and kids rebel? Why do they go against their parents? You know why? It's, it's acceptable. And a matter of fact, it's part of when I was in, in the field of psychology and we were doing developmental psychology, it's part of the understanding of, oh, well, they're going to rebel at some point or another because that's mm -hmm. just part of the process. No, it's not. Why is it part of the process? It's part of the process because the people who are trying to teach these children what they should do, don't do it themselves. Mm -hmm. So why should people on the street listen to us when we're not even walking our own talk? And when you walk your own talk, think of, think of the ones, think of the spiritual leaders in the world, all right, from the Jesuses to the Mohammeds to the Gandhis to the Martin Luther King Juniors to the Nelson Mandela's to Buddha, all of them, okay, they didn't have to nail it into anybody's head. They had to believe it, walk it, and more importantly, believe in the people that they were sharing it with. They believed in the people. Even at times, if it came across as resistance, like Gandhi resisted the British control there, but he wasn't doing it out of resistance. He was doing it because he was believing in their humanity. Mm -hmm. And he would allow them to beat him until they stopped because then they would just look at themselves and walk away. Which is why Jesus said, and anybody who believes in the words, or it was written for a reason, whether it be this character Jesus who truly existed, who I believe in, or something else that existed, these words were written, turn the other cheek. He didn't say walk away. He did not say walk away. He didn't say run away. He didn't say don't get into a fight. He said turn the other cheek. Stand there offering. You know if you're turning the other cheek, you're offering. Okay, you hit me here. It's going to make you feel better. Hit me here. Why are you doing that? Because you're believing that this person is going to eventually see in him or herself their own inhumanity and will stop because you're believing in them. So we need to believe in those people who are acting vilely. There is the God within them too. We don't want to pound it in their heads. We want to lead it ourselves and speak it ourselves. And then as we do that individually, and we do it as a group, and we talk about spiritual centers, and we do it positively, you know, not in a protesting march, but in a love march. Mm -hmm. You know, back in, it's very funny, but back in the 60s, 
You know, we laugh at that generation with all the drugs, but man, did they have the right idea. What did they walk around with? Well, they walk know, around with peace signs and love symbols. Mm-hmm. But those drugs lot. are coming back now, right? You can hear about the ayahuasca <laughs> and the psilocybin. And oh, the whole there is hope. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're making spiritual experiences now, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. Unbelievable. I don't know. It was yeah. pretty spiritual back then, too. <laughs> uh, yes, it was for the experience, yeah. but the point, point is, and what we missed back then, that they're thinking they're going to be able to use today is you have to come to it consciously and not with that with drugs and no drug makes you more evolved i don't care and i know there are people who go through the ayahuasca experiences they're vomiting all over the place and they think they're vomiting up their blockages and i'm like no you're vomiting up an entire week of dinner and if my italian grandmother saw that she would curse you okay she spent a lot of time making that pasta and now you're taking this stupid stuff because you can't consciously let go yeah right Right. Everything right. has to be conscious. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, why are we here? We could have stayed on the other side and just experienced our spiritual side and go, oh, everything is hunky-dory. But we're not. We're here because we want to understand what we know. And a drug can't do that. A choice can. But yes, we have to do the marches and the, and the gatherings with love and peace. And you know what happens? The outsiders, the ones that start, uh, look at those people. Ah, they're all hippies. They're all drug addicts. And then there's the other ones who are going, yeah, but they look like they're, they're feeling so good. And I feel so bad in my life. I, yeah, I, I'm just going to go see what how they're doing that. I've just got to go join them. And all of a sudden, that group gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we find 11 and- people. And all you do is find 11 people that way. Mm -hmm. But you have to start with yourself. It's the most powerful thing. The other thing I would like to say, in addition to this, people have asked me, what can we do to help in a way rather than teach them? Okay, with everything that's going on, the shootings and the parents that, oh, my gosh, that are are so, uh, you know, distraught over what's going on, the people in the Ukraine. How can I help over here? I'm just over here in the United States. I'm here in North Carolina. Okay, because we're all energies, we're also all connected. So number one, you have to add to the positive energy pool, not the negative energy pool. Anything that you do in your own life that's negative is going to keep feeding not only your negative pool, but the world's negative pool. So first, do something positive. It doesn't make a difference what it is for your family, for friends, for a complete stranger. But now go one step further. If the initial reason why people are acting out, and they are acting out because the inner child is hurt, is because they don't believe they're worthy, they don't believe they're lovable. These are the true feelings that people are carrying, that they're hiding with those defense mechanisms. I spell it out in my book there. Make someone feel good about him or herself. So, yes, you get a lot of kindness, acts of kindness that are out there that are fabulous. But take a moment to tell that person why you're doing an act of kindness. So when you're at Starbucks and you're getting a coffee and you want to pick up the the guy's coffee behind you or the woman's coffee behind you, turn around and say, I want to get your coffee because you're worth it. And I care about you. And pay for the coffee and leave. Before he hits you. Before he hits you, because he hits you crazy. <laughs> or, hits you, or hits you up for some of their expensive donuts and food. Right. Uh, <laughs> can I get right. a pound of coffee too while you're at it? No. The point is, when I do my work, I don't do it to get praise. I do it because I want people to get to feel what I got to feel about myself. Mm-hmm. But when they turn around, And they write me and they tell me, you've changed my life. I get that consistently. My book, I'm getting accolades on that like crazy from people. And I cannot tell you how much that feeds me. That's my positive energy pool. I made my brother, my sister feel good about him or herself. That is why in, I love Neil Donald Walsh's Conversations with God series, right? That's my Mm -hmm. favorite. That's it. That's my Bible. No, absolutely. Well, in book one, God turns around and says to to Neil, 
I wish everybody down on your planet was selfish, truly selfish, because if they were, they don't understand that they would be doing for their neighbors more than they know because of how good it makes them feel. The word selfish that we use today is completely non-existent because people are not selfish because they don't do for themselves. Because if they did do for themselves, they would be taking care of themselves more. They would be taking care of each other more because of how wonderful that feels. They're just trying to survive. That has nothing to do with selfishness. They're not thinking about themselves at all. So when I help people like that, it's just, it's remarkable feeling. So all you have to do then is let one person feel like that. And that lets them carry and, and it affects another person who affects another person. Nobody realizes how many people you affect every single day. You don't even know that one person you're talking to right here may be connected to Putin over in Russia that some way, somehow will get him a message or make him feel good, all because you made the cashier feel good about him or herself. Thank you. You, you took the time. You look so great today. I love that outfit that you put on. It, it just, it, and the colors in it just brings out your own personality. It's wonderful that you did that for yourself. Oh my God. They, they, they're like, who is this person? I've never heard that, you know, they just stop. And that just happened. We went over to South Africa on a vacation. It was absolutely fantastic. Nothing we ever thought we would do. Went on seven safaris. And I told one guy who was from South Africa and he was a, he was a tracker. He was the, the guide and in charge of the entire camp. Fabulous. And I told him how incredible he made our experience, my wife and I, not just because of the knowledge that he had, but because he cared enough to share more than he even needed to. He cared about us. And he had this man built like you can't believe, like he looks like an Aussie from Australia down under, you know, one, one, one of those guys. He started crying and he hugged me and he looked at his wife. He said, nobody has ever made me feel like that. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You'd absolutely deserve that. I'm sorry you have not felt that way. That is such a difference. And so that fed his energy pool. And that's how we can help each other is mm -hmm. make each other feel good because too much crap has made us feel bad. Mm. Vincent, I listen to every one of my shows when we release them. Every single one of my, of my shows. I listen to them exactly once, just for quality control. I know that this show, once we release it, I'm going to have on autoplay over and over again because the you. messages that you are giving us are so basic and yet so profound. Yeah. It's exactly what we needed to hear today. We didn't even have to ask anything. It was it's been great. I know. I, we, <laughs> just we just, like, just no, keep no, talking. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> no sit back and absorb the information. Yeah. This is perfect. This is wonderful. I know, this, I know but I, I don't want to make my host feel bad. It's like, a, why am not I? Here? Why not at all. Not at all. all. No, but we are not those hosts. We no. want you to hear Absolutely. your expertise. I so appreciate that in the both of you. And you have to understand, and I'm not saying this just to make you feel good, but the work that you're doing without without you, you ask, how do we get it into people's head? How do we get, this is what you're doing. You're getting it into people's head. And somebody will tell somebody about your show that tells somebody about your show and you get more people and you get more people. So you're the answer to your own question. And you've got to understand that that's what makes it work is you, you can't be afraid to put the good information out there to share your words, share it whichever way you want to. You're choosing this media and way of doing it. Other people do it with writing. Other people do it with speaking publicly or just being a friend in a community. Right. That's all we need to do. But we again, you've done so much work on yourselves. I can feel that, which is the only reason why you can recognize it in me. And so that is the answer, is the inner work. And again, you said something very profound, Will. It's so simple, yet it's so hard to get out there. The process is absolutely simple. The practice is what's difficult because we've got autoplay subconscious mind.
Mm -hmm. And we have to maintain control of that subconscious mind and what it wants to chatter and what it wants to bring up from within. And that is the purpose of mindfulness. It's not Eckhart Tolle and John Kabat-Zinn spoke about mindfulness. And it was more about paying attention to the here and now, right? right? Even Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, mm -hmm. worry about today, today has enough worries in it. They didn't mean it to be, just pay attention to your experiences today so you don't miss something. They meant it to be, pay attention to your experiences and your thoughts and feelings today because it's in today that you can change any of them that you don't like. But if you're not paying attention, you can't change them. They become automatic and you be just become responsive. So the work is paying attention. I write that so much. I said that is step one, is pay mm -hmm. attention to your thoughts and feelings. Catch the negative ones instantaneously. Turn them around and change them so you don't keep automatically believing in the negative. And that starts with your negative self-beliefs. Mm. Yep. And you've touched on conversations with God already. You've touched Ooh. on now Eckhart Tolle, which I'm reading right now, The Power ah. of Now, right? So it's, it's all these things that are resonating so, so clearly. Now, I, I got to ask you will, you, will you come back? Will you come talk to us again? Because we- Wait a I minute. Can, I could listen leave? To you. I, I, well, no, <laughs> you don't. You don't have to leave, but we do because we got. <laughs> you can stay here if you want. No. I no, but, oh my God! Anytime, anytime. We, you, I, you I could listen to you all day long, and in fact, anyone who wants to listen to you can by listening to the Jenna Effect. Right? You've got a show on your own. Yes. That you talk about all this kind of stuff on. So I invite everyone to subscribe mm -hmm. to that show because if you liked the messages that Vincent gave us today, you're going to love the Jenna effect. And even more so, his book is called The Secret That's Holding You Back. It was just released here in late June and it is bound to become a classic. I know uh, I'm getting one. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> We're going to add all the links to all that stuff in our show notes so you can go directly to our show notes, yeah. if you listen to it on your, on your phone right now, just click that little info button and you'll see all the links directly there. It'll get you directly in contact with Vincent and his show and his book. If you're listening to this on a radio, just go to skepticmetaphysician.com, go to his episode page and you'll see everything right there as well. Vincent, this has been unbelievable. I know we say that all the time. I know, but so much more than we expected. This is this is unbelievable. You just never know what, what to expect and you just blew everything, all of mm -hmm. our expectations out the window. So thank you so oh much. Oh my gosh. Thank you, you. Thank you so much. I, I, I so appreciate you giving me the opportunity to even do that. And you bring out, as hosts, you're the ones that can bring out the best in, in your guests, and you allowed that to happen with me. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. You're very kind. I don't think yes. you need any help from us whatsoever. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, and thank you for coming along on this journey of discovery with us. We'd love to continue our conversation with you on our website or on Facebook and Instagram under at Skeptic Metaphysician or SkepticMetaphysician.com. And if you're listening to this on the radio and you missed something, not to worry, all of our shows, including this one, can be found at skepticmetaphysician.com, where you can also watch the videos or even send us email or voicemails directly from the site. We absolutely love feedback and would appreciate hearing from you. Just like Vincent said, your thoughts, your emails, your voicemails, that's what feeds us. So we would love to hear from you. Well, we hope you enjoyed the show as much as we have. That's all for now. We'll see you on the next episode of The Skeptic Metaphysicians. Until then, take care. Bye.